Hey, welcome back to the channel. Maybe you're here for the first time. I shouldn't say welcome back because maybe you've never been here before. We're talking about the last episode of Shiny Happy People because you guys asked me to. It's crazy. I streamed about this on Friday of last week, so a week and a day, and 33,000 of you decided to watch that stream, which was really shocking. I didn't think that anyone really cared about this whole thing, um, but y'all really did. <laughs> and uh, I haven't gone through all the comments. I apologize. It's been a busy week, but I will be trying hopefully tomorrow afternoon to set some time aside and go through the comments, but I have seen them or at least most of them. And a lot of you guys asked me to talk about the fourth episode, because in that stream, I talked about how I only watched the first three and that I was about to watch the fourth one when my wife got back from work. Well, she got back, we watched it and <laughs> well, uh, let's just say I have some thoughts. I have some thoughts. Now, my thoughts are pretty much focused on the Joshua generation stuff. And that was the bulk of that episode. And honestly, the thing that you guys wanted me to talk about, you guys wanted me to look at this thing and talk about the Joshua generation. And for those who might not know, maybe you didn't finish the documentary. Maybe it was too much. That's, that's something that I saw over and over again in that, in that, uh, in the comments there is that it was just too much for you. And I totally understand. You know, we all have our stories. We all have things that trigger us. So I totally respect that if you weren't able to watch it or just didn't want to. Uh, I get that. So for anyone who might not know about the Joshua generation, uh, basically the documentary went from talking about the Duggars, focusing on Josh Duggar, and then going from that and bridging it to the really, I think, the source of their ideology. What? Sure, buddy. I'm at home with my kids there. We want to play the Nintendo switch instead of the iPad. That's fine. Um, his older brother's up there with him. Uh, but <laughs> they, they went to the source with Bill Gothard and uh, we talked quite a bit about that in the last stream, but from there they say, okay, well, Bill Gothard is an old man. You know, his influence has waned as far as him going and actually talking uh, at conferences and all of that. Although he had been, you know, certain people, maybe with a creation museum. thing. All right. Um, but they, he had been going and doing, you know, talking points until, you know, a couple of years ago, basically when accusations started coming out and all of a sudden nobody's having him come and speak, but there was an influence and the documentary, I think did a really good job of just a good job in general, but bridging the gap from, all right, where did this lead to? And it led to these young people who were radicalized. Like, I don't think there's a different way that you could put it. Like they had those beliefs of what gender looks like and how it behaves and uh, Christian morality related to the family. And it was an extreme version of that. And we talked about that in the last stream. If you want to hear more about my thoughts, you can go and check out that stream. Um, but we talked all about that stuff. And what does that do to a young person? You know, when they start thinking about the world and what they want to do in the world, well, it means action. It means movement, right? If you're talking to young people, like they're usually the ones at the heart of any kind of revolt, rebellion, reformation, you know, it's, it starts even if you go back to the reformation, 1517, Martin Luther nailing the 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg. That's a university. He was a professor. He radicalized his students, and I think for the better, and I think the world has shown that, the history of the world has shown that, that it was a good thing, not just even for Christianity, but for the world. Uh, a lot of freedoms from the Reformation, but it usually starts with young people, and even bad movements <laughs> are still the same. It's why you see different organizations having all kinds of attacks different uh you know it depends on the organization what they're trying to accomplish but usually it's done by the young people like there might be older people who are like in charge or leading it but then it comes down to the younger people because they're more inclined they're more inclined to do something about that that ideology uh maybe it's this 
thing about being young. You have like an ideal kind of version in your head of how the world works. And you just think if you grit and grind hard enough, you'll have some movement. Well, the Joshua generation was really all about that. You take that morality and all the fear-based us versus them with that form of extreme, I think, outside the boundaries of Orthodox Christianity. Um, But you take that extreme version of politicized Christianity and really you say, okay, we're going to actually bring this to the forefront in culture. And how that happened was them basically trying to get involved in politics and I guess it even worked. They they showed the the video of that guy. I don't remember his name. I'm up in Canada. You know, I've been here for a while now, so I don't I don't really know what's going on in the states. And to be honest, I'm pretty happy for it. Uh, but they they had you know this this congressman I think, and then they just had a bunch of people who were like, you know, I was I was the secretary for you know this uh, this uh, Supreme Court judge. You know, like things like that. It's like what. These people were building up their influence and really what it was about was not about trying to make the lives of American citizens better. It was about making the lives of American citizens Christian. And again, I'll say it like this, Christian, because we're not talking about theology. We're not talking about Jesus. Even a lot of you guys actually pointed out in the comment section of that stream that it was like, where was Jesus in this thing? He wasn't there. They never talked about Jesus. They never talked about him. They talked about Christianity and the Bible, but they never actually talked about Jesus. The reason why is because Jesus has nothing to do with what these people were trying to accomplish. Uh, They they wanted to force their view of Christianity and what that would look like in a practical way of how you dress, how you behave, what is legal and not legal in regards to sexuality, gender, and families, uh, which I'm not saying I disagree with some of that stuff. I'm just saying, like, they went extreme and were saying, like, this needs to be forced on every single American citizen. And they brought that to the judicial system, to the legislature. They're trying to pass laws. Now, uh, let's let's talk about it for a second. I want to I want to just think about the Joshua generation. And I want you to think about that name because I don't that's the one thing that I wish they would have just done a little bit more on. They they talked about it briefly because they had one of the founders in the documentary. But Joshua, a military leader, you know, for, uh, in the Bible, he has a book named after him. Right. He carries over for Moses and they're supposed to go into the Israelites are supposed to go into the land of Canaan and take it over. Um, and they, they were blessed by God to go and do that. But that was a special thing that God was deliberately, like specifically talking to the people of Israel and like holding the sun in place, (laughs) like all this kinds of stuff. Like it's, it's an amazing thing that he did there. And obviously he was with them. We don't see him acting like that today, but these people who started this thing, they saw themselves as Joshua's in a land of Canaan. They saw themselves as extreme military leaders who were going to combat the Canaanites. In other words, their own citizens (laughs) like this. This is basically people saying we're going to war with culture. And they talked about that, the culture war, the culture war, the culture war. And it's one of the things I constantly make fun of on my channel. I, I'm not saying I'm the funniest guy in the world, but you know, I have a little bit of fun talking about the culture wars. You can, there's a playlist here on my channel of letters from the culture war. And we, we kind of tease some of these people. It's fun. Uh, But they, they just want everything to be about like this physical thing. And again, that's carried down from Gothard. That's carried down from the IBLP. That's carried down from all that line of thinking and saying that, you know, holiness, like biblical holiness of trying to please God with your life, it looks like this. And they try to take something that is spiritual and make it tangible, something you could feel, something you could touch, something you could attain, like you could actually just do and know that you're holy. And that's what Bill Gothard was really all about. And so they do that 
with politics. And they say, okay, if, if that's what it looks like in our daily lives, then let's bring that to the political forum where we can just say this, we could be a holy Christian nation because we do X, Y, and Z because we don't do X, Y, and Z. And they radicalize the youth and they start going at it. And people who watched the documentary, and I saw this in the comments section, there was a, there was a real sense of fear about that. Because there's, there's a lot, obviously, with that. Because one, you're taking Jesus just like out of the equation of Christianity. So you have, when you have a Jesus-less Christianity, it's not Christianity. But, you know, set that aside for a minute. And you got young people who are infiltrating things with an actual purpose to change everything. And they don't talk about that. <laughs> like they might have a website, which we could look at. You know, you could see about JGM, uh, Joshua Generation Movement, is an initiative from the Lord. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess God just talked to him and said, you need to do this. Uh, the name was coined from the biblical Joshua who succeeded Moses on the journey to take the Israelites from the house of bondage to a land of freedom, a land that flows with milk and honey. Joshua took over from Moses in the wilderness and was able to lead the people to their promised land. So uh, Amy is in the chat and says, this seems like a jihadist movement. And yeah, it's an extreme movement. It's an extreme movement that I think is very dangerous because not only is it just ideology that's pretty much opposed to a lot of like Americans opinion. And that's the way countries work is you get the general opinion of the people and that should win out. Right. Uh, but also like you're distorting Christianity, even here, this narrative that they're giving like buried in this narrative, you know, you might just be like, Oh, okay. They're just talking about Joshua, but they're saying that they're Joshua. Like they're the people that are going to combat their own friends, their own family, their own country to take it over and win it for God. Now, there is an ideology that is happening like right now where people are just switching over this thing like crazy. And it's a view on their eschatology, which if you're not familiar with theology, is the study of the last days, what the Bible says about the last days. And this view of eschatology that a lot of people are switching to that would be akin to this is postmillennialism which means that there's going to be a millennium. You can see that in Revelation 20 uh, about like this utopian version of Christ ruling and what that looks like. And there's different views in Christianity about when that happens and how that happens. Post-millennials believe that uh, essentially we're going to do it. That Christians are the ones who are going to bring this millennial kingdom, this thousand-year utopian reign of Christ, into existence on physical earth through our actions, through what they would say, the declaration of the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for sinners. If you uh, believe in him, repent of your sin, you can, you can be saved from your sin and belong to him. Uh, but at the end of the day, they don't talk about the gospel. Like these people who are like real proponents of post-millennialism, they actually sound quite a bit like the Joshua generation right now. Like I'm not saying historically, I'm saying the people who are switching to this team right now. I'm talking about Doug Wilson. I'm talking about Dale Partridge. I'm talking about Joel Webin. I'm talking about all these reformed folks. I'm reformed. They're reformed. And they're, they're trying to say, well, we need to just win in culture. And those who, uh, you know, have different points of view, they have loser theology and we're the winners. So we're just going to like bring the gospel to the culture and by the gospel, again, they never mean the message that I talked about. They always mean the rules, the law of the old Testament and bringing that to American government, because specifically we're talking about the United States. And there are some talk, like some people talking about it here in Canada. And honestly, they're nuts. They are so nuts if they think that's going to have any effect. But also the guys down there are pretty much that way too. But that's, that's essentially what the Joshua generation was trying to do. And it's fractured, but there's still movement there. 
Because again, you have this ideology from Gothard and people like him, this, this really fundamentalist view of spirituality, that everything is tangible, you just need to do things, it's rules and regulations, and if you keep those, you're honoring Jesus, which again, they don't talk about Jesus, they'll, they'll say honoring the Lord, as if the Lord is like the fourth person of the Trinity. It's Jesus, and they just don't want to talk about Jesus, <laughs> but you know they'll honor the Lord through those tangible things, but at the end of the day, they're not bringing the gospel out to the culture. They're not talking about the real tenets of the faith. They're saying, let's, let's make sure that the heathens act like Christians, and that they, like, and again, by acting like Christians, it's their version of Christianity. It's the rules. It's the regulations. It's all the law from the Old Testament and throwing it on people who really just don't understand even. Like, not that they do either, but they're basically saying that everyone in the country has to be Christian. Now, I'm a Baptist, and some of these people claim to be Baptists. And to me, that's insane. Uh, because one of the Baptist tenets, all right, one of the things that makes me a Baptist is the belief that there is a separation, a God ordained separation of church and state. That is a Baptist distinctive. And Baptists today are just like, no, we need to throw that out. We need to throw that out, or at least some of these Baptists. We need to throw that out because we need to get to, the, like the again, this idolized version in their head that never existed of the 1950s. And that everyone looked this way, and they all went to church, and now they're, the church parking lots are empty. And, you know, like that means that this culture is going to hell in a handbasket and all that stuff that we talked about before. And so in order to confront that, and to be this idea of leading to this millennial reign of Christ that will be on earth, according to them, and that will be brought about by their own actions. When I was in college, we talked about this as in ushering in the kingdom. Uh, now, let's talk about the kingdom a little bit, because these guys, this Joshua generation, the people that were specifically talked about, and I'll talk about the Paul Morgan thing in a minute. Um, but these people that were specifically talked about in the documentary uh, about the Joshua generation, listen to what they talk about as far as uh, the kingdom. All right. So, so they talk about the place of the church. The church until now has been in the outer court and in the holy place. And more than ever, God is calling her to the most holy place. <sighs> I got to be honest, the way they describe that, that really sounds like you know, fricking Scientology or something, uh, for her to start t uh, taking responsibility for the advancement of his kingdom on earth. So who is responsible for the advancement of the kingdom? In other words, the building of the kingdom. It's the church, uh, his kingdom on earth. The spirit of the Lord speaks expressly that it is time for man, humanity, to be redirected back to the true essence of existence which is in the life Adam lived in the garden before his fall. The Lord gave the garden a symbol of the earth to Adam to manage it. He had dominion over everything in the garden, but above all, he was to live by the dictates of the Almighty. God has called the church, but his emphasis is the kingdom. Say, say what? <laughs> like, I'm sorry. His, God has called the church, but his emphasis is the kingdom. Uh, I have no idea. Oh, let me let me say it like real clear. Okay. I have a bachelor's in Bible. I have a master's in ministry. I have a master's of divinity and I've been in pastoral ministry for a decade. I have zero idea what they mean by that. Okay. <laughs> I, it's, it's not theological. It's nonsense. And the sense that I can make out of it is really, really troubling. But God has called the church, but his emphasis is the kingdom. Uh, his intent is to use the church to expand the kingdom on earth. The church is not the kingdom, but an integral part of it. The kingdom is the vastness of God's creation, which includes humans, animals, plants, the galaxy, and the cosmic realms. The church is the body of believers of Christ here on earth, while the kingdom is the totality of God's creation and domain. By the Spirit of God, we are leading a movement of people with a changing paradigm to enforce that's a big word, <laughs> okay, to enforce.
force. It's just, it's just nuts. Enforce the kingdom of God and its principles on the earth in all fields of human endeavors, and more especially using the seven mountains of influence. Again, this sounds like Scientology. Seven mountains of influence, media, entertainment, family, government, economy, education, and religion. So these are the people who are, you know, with the the documentary specifically talking about, you know, infiltrating all these seven mountains of influence in order to fulfill their directive, which is to enforce the kingdom of God and its principles. Again, once I, once again, I'm just so glad to be a Baptist, okay? Because Baptist, once again, is like the separation of church and state. That's ours. Uh, it's actually a principle that we came up with, or at least congregationalists and where we come from, our spiritual ancestors came up with, really, um, or at least modernized. Uh, but also, individual soul liberty is like one of our things, which means that everyone should believe as their conscience leads them that that no one should be forced to have the gospel put on them and that is insane to enforce the kingdom of god and its principles now what what does that mean for today like you could look at them and just be like the joshua generation they're wacko crazy nuts you know out there you know wearing their red and blue uh, red, white, and blue and trying to invade all that stuff. And we can know who they are and they're ridiculous. Um, but also there are people that seem just like that who are pretty dang popular in Christian circles and becoming more and more popular. And they sound just like this. All right. Uh, they, those post millennials, those people who are taking the kingdom of God into their own hands and saying, that they are the ones who are responsible for it, to enforce it. Let me be clear. The Bible never says that Christians are called to enforce the kingdom, even to build the kingdom. You know what the Bible actually says, what Jesus says about his kingdom? He says that his kingdom is not of this world. That means it's it's not here. It's It's not something that you can go to right now and be in the kingdom. This kingdom is not of this world. It's it's a kingdom of the heart. And I know that sounds kind of ridiculous and it sounds corny, but it's true. It's people who believe in Jesus, they are his kingdom. Now, this expands past the church to anyone who has ever believed in the true God of the Bible, uh, but we are his kingdom. And what Jesus says about his kingdom is not that we as Christians should go and advance his kingdom, that we should go and um, you know build his kingdom. Jesus says his promise to the church is that he will build his kingdom. He will build it. Not me. Not you. Not First Baptist Church down the street. Not the Pentecostal Church down the street a little bit further. Not the non-denominational church, which is really a Baptist church you know, across the street. No, Jesus is going to build his church. It's his responsibility. And thankfully, because that's true, because he builds his church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, he's going to win because he's really good at his job. His job is to build the church and he's God. So yeah, he's going to get his job done. He's going to build his church. He will be glorified in it. And it is not my responsibility, my burden, my guilt to fulfill that. Now, I do have a job. All Christians do have a job to fulfill the Great Commission, which is an individual thing. When Jesus, right before he goes into heaven, he says, go and make disciples. Now, what these people, the Joshua generation, what these post-millennials today, Doug Wilson, Dale Partridge, Joel Webbin, James White, I think, is now part of it. Uh, Apologia Radio, all these guys, what they're saying is, oh, we do whole nations, which is ridiculous. Uh, That is not what it means. It's talking about people, all different kinds of people, 
that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just for Israel anymore. It was contained in Israel. They were the ones who had a special relationship with God. But because the veil is torn, because Jesus rose from the dead, now that gospel is going into all the world. And it's the good news. It's theology. It's not rules. It's not regulation. It's not laws. It's a belief that you believe in Jesus, that he is who he said he was, that I am the way, the truth, the life, and go and tell that to people. Make them into disciples. And what that means is that they follow. They follow just like you follow Jesus. And that's it. And yes, that's going to have an impact in their life. And yes, that's probably going to have an impact in how they vote and how they live their lives politically. But it's not the goal. The goal is not, oh, you can make this nation Christian with the laws and legislation. And if only we get, you know, two more Supreme Court justices who are aligned like us and we plan this out for the next 25 to 30 years, we could win this thing. That's not the goal. The goal is Jesus. The goal is loving him, living like him, pleasing him, and letting him do the work. He's going to build his church. Now, these people, the Joshua generation, they got no clue. They got zero clue about what that actually means. They just think, because they've been trained to think this way, that if they just work hard enough and they just, you know, grit and grind and and they they just follow all the rules and the legislation and they they move things along and they just have that impact on that, you know, powerful person. Next thing you know, they're the powerful person. They they've had that drilled into them. They're wrong. That's not what the Bible talks about. The Bible talks about people as people. And then we care for people. And because you care for them, you you share the love of Jesus with them. You share the, the gospel with them. And that's how you have an impact with them. It's not, all right, now you vote like me. Now, if you believe in the Bible, there are going to be things that you're going to vote similarly on. And you're going to have similar views on. But you may not have the exact same views. But that's what these people are all about. These people are all about uniformity. That you just do exactly like we do. And this is how we please God. And this is how we get God on our side. It's not accurate. Now, in the documentary, uh, they, they showed, all right, this is the Joshua generation. They looked at like the actual organization. And then as they did that, they started talking about Christian influencers and like really conservative Christian influencers. And that's where I had a little bit of trouble um, because I don't think that they did a good job of explaining who, like who and how they, they fit into this story. Now they talked about this couple here, uh, Paul and Morgan, who are YouTubers, uh, and you could see honest and entertaining relationship talk. Essentially what they do is they talk about sex and dating and marriage and relationship advice and things like that. Got to be honest, not the kind of stuff I watch on YouTube, <laughs> like not interested in the slightest, but you know, they, they got 157,000 subscribers. So they're doing something right as far as that goes. And I have 4,000. So I appreciate all 4,000 of you, but I'm just saying like, there's, there's a little bit of a disparity. here. <laughs> so they have a lot of influence and they were on, uh, the documentary and I got to say, I don't think that they should have been at least not in the way that it was shown uh, because the documentary made it clear. Like they showed like the Joshua generation as an organization and like that's scary stuff. That's all the stuff that I was just talking about. But then they went into like these Christian influencers and saying like, this is it too. And that's not accurate. Like these, these people, Paul Morgan, they did a stream and I watched, I, I did I watch all of it? I don't think I watched all of it. YouTube's lying. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> they they talked about um, how they were lied to. They, they were led to believe that they were coming in and giving like this holistic view on on the Joshua generation or not even the Joshua generation that they were focusing on on Bill Gothard. And they have a little bit of impact from, uh, I think, uh, who's this guy again? Paul. 
Uh, he, I think he talked about his family having some of that. But yeah, it's oh, <laughs> uh, way to make hit make me hit button, sir. I hope it's the like button. I hope it's the like button and the subscribe button. <laughs> but um, yeah, so like they're they're talking about how they had a little bit of influence from the Gothard stuff, but that that's it. They didn't even know about the Joshua generation. So I do think it's a little unfair for them to be like. Ooh, here's here's these YouTubers that are the Joshua generation, because I think a lot of us are scared about the impact that some of these influencers, whether they're Christian or not, are having on young people. Right. Like I get really nervous about some of these people that are being lauded. Like I'll even say something really controversial. Uh, I saw a missional wear, which uh, if you look over here, I have a I have a sticker of missional wear, which used to be about reform theology. And they were like sharing Ali Beth Stuckey quotes. Like what? Like reform theology. And you're sharing Ali Beth Stuckey stuff. Like, I'm sorry. Like I don't, I don't watch her stuff, but like, she's not a reformed theologian. What the heck is going on? Like it's the impact that a lot of these influencers are having. That is just like, it's just scary, you know, like some people should be listened to on some things and then not listened to on some other things. And uh, I think young people just don't understand that. And so they're just listening to voices that have no credentials. We'll talk about that in the next stream about Dale Partridge, uh, but they have no credentials and they're taking them as authoritative figures. And what this documentary was doing was saying like, that's what's happening here. You know, oh, they're like being influenced by these people and they don't know it and all that kind of stuff. And, um, I think there's some truth to that. I think that these people who are very conservative and I've watched just a little bit of their stuff. And I remember, uh, he was on, uh, one of the bigger channels talking about Alan Parr and, um, like a thumbnail that was inappropriate. I thought it was inappropriate. And he was saying that it was. And so like, I agree with him on some things, this Paul guy, um, but I haven't watched a lot of their stuff, but what I have watched is like, okay, they're a really conservative Christian couple and they're giving advice from that perspective, which does have a lot of overlap with the Gothard stuff and the stuff like they even talked about in the documentary about uh, submission and Ooh, submission. And, ah, uh, you know, like they doing all the jokes about it. Uh, but like they, they're, I think they're wrong on that subject. Uh, but they, they decided that they're going to kind of use them. And that's, that's where I think it went a little bit off on the documentary with these people, because they have no connection to the Joshua generation. And while I do think that there's overlap as far as like the content that they're pushing out, um, to say that they belong to this, I think was pretty wrong for the the documentary makers and the way that they did it. If you watch this video, this top one here, uh, they lied to us uh, and going into the story of all that. I think it's pretty clear. Like they feel like the, the makers of the documentary just straight up lied to them to get them on the show so they could use them as a punching bag. And I think that's, that's really deceitful and shouldn't have happened. And they should have been given an opportunity to watch it before. That would be something that I would do of just like, if I'm going to be involved in a documentary, I need to be able to see it before it goes, at least to prepare. Um, Cause you never know how people are going to use stuff. I've, I found that out <laughs> people, even with 4,000, some people want to take my stuff and use it against me, whatever. Um, but yeah, it's just a lot of that kind of stuff. Now, again, there are people in the Joshua generation who are specifically going at culture, like uh, just in the same, like what, what even they, they talked about, the seven mountains, you know, of media and entertainment and politics. So they go at politics and they go at media in this way. But to say that these people were part of it when they weren't, I think is really deceitful for the documentary. And I didn't appreciate it. And uh, even if, like I said, there's overlap, and I think that's pretty clear that there's overlap in the things that they say and the stuff that Gothard has taught in the past. And I don't think that these people would even see it, you know, cause that's like, again, Gothard, Gothard's influence cannot be understated. That's what I said in the stream. And I stand by that. Like he had influence on so many people who then had influence on others. And a lot of these people are talking about things and giving examples. And you're like, Oh dang, man, that's, that's from, you know, that, that guy that's from Gothard. You know, like that. It's, uh, 
but they don't know it. And so I'm not going to blame them for not knowing it. I'm not going to use them as like the face of something. So that's just something that I saw there. But I do think that there are people who are on Instagram and all those different things that are just like, they're just like those people. And I think that that is accurate. You know, something that the documentary showed. So the Joshua generation, it's nothing new. We'll say that the Joshua generation is, but these post millennials have been around for a while. Sometimes good, you know, that is a belief structure and they're trying to do good work to like in their, in their wording, advance the kingdom that they're trying to spread the gospel. Um, but then there's other guys like, like I said, Doug Wilson, Dale Partridge, all those kinds of people who are doing it to advance political endeavors rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know that because of what they're saying, <laughs> because, because of what they're actually putting out is, does it have the gospel? If it doesn't have the gospel, then you can guess, you know, what their motivations are. And a lot of times it's pretty dang obvious, but that's just me. Let me, let me see if there's anything here. Um, do, 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 do. I see a couple people here in the chat. Let's see. Uh, why does my mouse keep on going over there? All right, Caleb. Uh, yeah, I was thinking that the NAR folks had the whole seven mountains of influence stuff too. Yeah, there, it's not a new thing. Um, uh, Bright Fires here and says, I'm a Quaker and we have the spices acronym. And I know that Calvinists have doctrine explained by Tulip, but I get highly upset at the idea of enforcing one idea of religion. Yes. And as a Baptist, and I think just Christians in general, but specifically as a Baptist, it goes against my beliefs that you sh everyone has the right to believe or not believe as they see fit, as they're led by their conscience, because that's how belief works. You can't force someone to believe something. Like, it's ridiculous. It, it, it's not actual belief if you force it on people. Um and Britt was here and says, that'll preach. And Wendy, yep, Jesus will build his church. Only he can. Absolutely. Orlando's here and says, amen, brother, about that. Um, let's see. Pamela's here. Anybody in the chat use PACES? Oh, snap. ACE curriculum. Gotta love the acronyms or wisdom literature. It's interesting. Uh, I didn't even know what wisdom literature was until I was watching the documentary and like, Oh, we had that lying around the house. I wonder if my dad, who went to some of these conferences and stuff, was thinking about homeschooling us, because that would have been nuts. But yes, I went to a private school, and we had Pace's Ace Virtuson, Christy, was it Meek Joy? Pudge, no, Pudge Meek Way, Christy something. You know, remember those cartoons? Oh my goodness, the Pace's, ridiculous. Uh, Sam says, I had never heard of them, but I do actively avoid people like that on YouTube too. <laughs> I just, I, it's not for me. I'm sorry. I just like, nope. Uh, Orlando says in your last stream about the IPLP, I said the same thing about how they represent a Christian, certain Christian influencers. Yeah, I agree. And I wasn't sure if I was going to agree with you, Orlando, like, cause you know, we're different people. Um, but like when I saw it, I was like, Orlando was right. <laughs> like, I do think that there's overlap, but uh, Brightfire says like and subscribe. Yes, I appreciate it. Uh, Heidi says, did Dean just say young people like he's an old man sitting on his porch in a rocking chair? I can't help it. All right. Get off my lawn. Uh, <laughs> don't make me don't make me bust out all the old man talk. Um, Potluck says, can you expand on how Doug Wilson doesn't talk about the gospel, but is politically motivated? LOL. Just by the fact that you said LOL potluck, I know that you're a Doug Wilson fanboy. So you can watch a bunch of different videos that I'm pretty sure Doug Wilson has seen and he knows exactly what I'm talking about. And then you can go and read all of his blogs that are all about how the America sucks and that, you know, that's it. And we just need the church. But he doesn't talk about Jesus and he doesn't talk about the gospel. The reason why is because he doesn't have a gospel, not a genuine orthodox gospel because he believes in salvation by law, by rules, by mustering up faith. He does not believe in justification by faith alone, 
because he believes in federal vision. I have videos about that, but I'm sure you would not like them. Um, Dwayne says, I watched about an episode and a half, but found that it seemed to be an avenue to attack Christianity generally. I see that from people. Um, let me let me talk about that, Dwayne, because I really disagree. I respect your opinion, but I completely disagree um, because I thought they were actually pretty good in keeping it focused. They kept it focused on this branch, this this fundamentalist branch, and they didn't go and branch that out to, you know, everyone who I don't know, like take like. Presbyterians, like it's Presbyterians are like this too. They didn't go like that. They didn't say it's all, you know, independent fundamental Baptists. They didn't go that far. They didn't bring anyone else into it other than these YouTubers. And I do think that they misrepresented them. Uh, but I don't think it was an attack on Christianity. I think it was an attack at a fake branch of Christianity. Um, and uh, like they kept it contained. If they had branched out and were like, oh, all these people then yeah. Or if it was like the Hillsong documentary where all of a sudden they're bringing in narratives and saying like, Oh, these, uh, like the, all these Christians suck because they believe in all these different other things. It's like, that's not what we're here to talk about. For me, that separates it, but you're, you're inclined to your pos uh, position. You're welcome to have it. Um, but I'm just saying I disagree. Um, <laughs> Dean has an old soul and a younger body. Uh, I don't know. I played basketball the other day. I didn't feel did feel like younger body. <laughs> Sarah, as much as I prefer conservative laws, it is a lot easier to tell apart the sheep from the goats in this day and age. If everyone looks, acts the same, it's easier to miss who needs Jesus. I don't know. Uh, yes. And like, this is something that is put out by a lot of these post millennials now where they're trying to say like, wouldn't it be better? Like, that's how they put it a lot of times. Well, wouldn't you rather have people that at least believe in Jesus to be ruling rather than secularists. Um, the problem with that <laughs> is that it never stays. Like, let's let's grant, like, all right, let's say that everyone who believes in that, they actually are Christians. It never stays that way. It never stays that way. Look in history. Anytime there's been a Christian nation, which I would argue there never has been, whenever it's attempted, though, it always becomes uh, persecution. Uh, of people who don't fit into the specific line of thinking. Because again, who makes these rules then? Like they want to say like, oh, we, it's ridiculous to say that we want an evangelical Pope. Like if, if this were to happen, which again, it's never going to happen. Like these people are in like cuckoo dreamland where they're just like making up this idea that, oh, we have so much influence. No, we don't. Like we're the minority. So get over it. <laughs> like it's just not happening. But they want like it's a hypothetical thing that will never really happen in North America. But, you know, let's put that aside. Um, eventually, it would have to be someone's going to make the decision of what's Christian, what's not. Somebody's going to have to or a group is going to have to. And then all of a sudden you got a pope system again. Um. Ryan says, unfortunately, our culture thinks all Orthodox Christians are fundamentalists. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I think that there, there's some truth to that. A lot of truth, actually, to that. Um, when it comes to specific things about gender and sexuality, I think that a lot of people, the majority, would probably say that. Um, but I think if they know you, if they know you and how much you love them, then they won't think that of you. And I think that's how, that's how we make progress, you know, of just knowing people, letting them live life with us as dumb as a phrase that is live life. It's the same thing. Um, but when we live life with these people and they know us and they know that we're not jerks and that we're not, you know, condescending judgmental people. And they know this is why we believe certain things. And it's because the Bible says it and not in a, like the Bible says it. So get over it. This is what it is now. This is law, you know, like, like how some of these people really come off and they do come across as like that ridiculous. Um, and I think people see that and they react to that and they call those people fundamentalists, maybe even without knowing everything that they believe, but just because of the way that they come off, 
but I don't think that like, let me put it this way. I have, I have friends who are not Christians. I have a lot of unchristian. Most of my friends aren't Christians anymore. (laughs) And they know, they don't think of me as a fundamentalist. Like they would never say that Dean's a fundamentalist. They might know that I have a past in independent fundamental Baptist churches, but they wouldn't be like Dean's a fundamentalist. Uh, They would say Dean has different beliefs than me, but they wouldn't put me in those terms. So I think it's about knowing people and having an impact on how they view Christians through how they know you. But that's just me. All right, guys, uh, we are going to end this stream in a second, and it's going to go to a different stream where I talk about something else. We're going to be talking about one of the people who I think fits into this category of like this, uh, like not the actual organization, but this Joshua generation, what they're trying to do, like this post-millennial idea of winning the culture war and, you know, enforcing the kingdom. We're going to talk about somebody like that. And I have a lot of things to say because there have been some updates on this guy. We're going to talk about Dale Partridge here in just a couple minutes. I need to just make sure everything's going well with uh, boys upstairs. And I'll be right back for another stream. So don't go anywhere. But if you do, hit the like button before you head out somewhere else, you know. <laughs> 